All right. Well, Julie, I am so excited to hear your story. I don't know a lot. Um, so I'm excited <laughs> to just, you know, hear it for the first time and, um, yeah, tell, well, let's start with, let's hear a little bit about you and kind of, um, what you do and just, you know, all the things. Oh my gosh. Um, so much. Let's see. I am, um, a mom of four. Um, my kids are ages four to nine. And so, <laughs> and that, and that typical, like, you know, Utah mom has all the kids so close together. Um, I'm 37 years old. I live, like I said, in Lehigh with my husband and kids. We have two dogs. Um, I've been through kind of a lot of career changes. I don't know if you could say that in my adult life. I was um, almost right out of high school. I joined the military. So I served in the army for five years and that was um, a great experience. It taught me a lot. There's a lot of things I don't like about the army, but there's a lot of things that I really value from my service. Um, and then after that, I, um, in the military as a computer geek. So I just worked on all the information systems. And then after that, I transitioned into the civilian life and started a career in information technology. I worked for a big, um, organization in Salt Lake city. So I was a computer, computer geek. And then after that, uh, I, I quit there when I got pregnant with my first, actually after my first was born, I left, um, and have been living the stay at home mom life, but my few, my birth experiences have shifted my mindset and I want to help other people have better birth experiences. So I became a doula seven years ago, um, after my second really empowering birth. And I've been helping women, um, have babies ever since. Um, more recently, I have become a birth photographer. So I'm more birth photographer now, a little less doula work. And that's really cool to be able to be such a and it, or be a part of people's experiences that they bring their babies into the world and um, get to document that beautifully for them to remember. So that's really cool. Um, I was going to say one other thing. Um, oh yeah, and I also co-founded a company called the VBAC Link. So um, lots of women in our country have cesareans and think that they need to have cesareans for the rest of their births and. The reality of it is that vaginal birth after cesarean is a safe and reasonable option for most parents who have had a C-section. They're just not given the information, education, or support in order to have that. So the VBAC link is created to, like we have podcasts as well. We have doula, we train doulas, we have parents and um, share information, teach classes and stuff all over the world. So it's really cool uh, for that. So awesome. yeah, that's kind of about me. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's dive into it. Let's, let's hear your story of coming back to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. I, I love that you're doing this. First of all, I saw, like, I think on Facebook somewhere and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to be part of this because I feel like, um, right now, especially lately in the last several years, there's been a lot of stories about people leaving and just leaving. And I think it's really empowering for people to, who have left or who are coming back to have this type of support, because I didn't have support of my family when I was coming back. I had a few close friends that kind of became family and without that system, I don't know what I've done. And so to have something available like this, I think is really, really cool. So I'm excited for what you're doing. Um, I think like a coming, coming back story kind of has to start with a leaving story, I guess you could say. So, um, I was born, um, in the church. My mom and dad were sealed in the Salt Lake city temple. I was like born in the covenant and, um, two, I was the oldest. So I had two, I have two siblings, one each, a brother and a sister. Um, and I grew up in a really little rural town in Southern Utah and, church was always, I mean, my, my dad was always kind of the guy that I could go to with questions or, um, kind of like the scholar, I guess you could say. And he was a convert when he was 17, he got converted. And then he went on a mission, um, a couple of years later, and then his parents got baptized while he was on his mission. So that was kind of cool. Um, but it was interesting, like growing up, I don't know, I can reflect back now, like 20, 30 years ago, right? Because I am that old that I can look back that far now. Um, 
looking back and seeing like the different dynamics in my house, um, how some things were a little bit unhealthy in relationship with the church. And we, we would have moments like as teenagers, right? You're teenagers and you kind of like rebel. It's just what teenagers do. Right. And so I had a, a period of time where I, I was kind of a difficult teenager. I'm not going to lie. Um, and I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to do a lot of the things that my parents, um, household had in order you know, for us to do like the rules or the requirements. And so if I didn't go to church one day, my dad would ground me until like, I'd be grounded until I went to church next. And I feel like there's a couple little things like that that were really unhealthy in that relationship, but nothing too, um, I don't know, too drastic or too big, like that alone themselves would have pushed me away. But when I was 17 years old, um, well, I guess first, let me kind of preface this with, uh, one of my very first or my very first memory at all ever as a child was of being sexually abused mm-hmm. by a babysitter that we had had at our house. And then after that, I had started being abused by my grandpa, <clears throat> my dad's dad. And so from the time I was four till the, till the time I was a teenager, I was being continually like sexually abused. And I think that's kind of, um, a big part of the story. So, um, it was pretty traumatic. I'm actually still healing right now from that. So working on that trauma and all of the stuff healing. So I'm so proud of everybody who, um, takes the time to heal themselves so that they don't continue, um, the generational stuff, you know, that just keeps going. So anyways, when I was 17, I actually was just before I turned 17, I came home from school one day and my, I, the, there's a four generation picture hanging up on our wall of my brother, my dad, his dad, and then his grandpa. So four generations. So my brother, dad, grandpa, great grandpa, and the picture was off the wall. And I don't know why I noticed it the first thing when I walked in my house, but, um, I walked into the office and I saw my mom. I'm like, Hey, where'd the four generation picture go? And my mom was at the computer crying. She was crying. And I was like, what's going on? Like I'm 16 year old teenager. I'm like, what the heck's going on? I was the first one home. And my mom <clears throat> told me like, sit down. And I was like, all right, like, well, <laughs> starting to feel a little weird here. So she told me that my dad had been arrested. And I said, arrested for what? Well, it turns out that he was abusing my brother and one of my brother's friends. They were 12, probably little 12 year olds, 12 year old boys. My dad was um, molesting them and he had been for a while. My mom uh, had walked in on them. These are all parts of the story that I've learned through the years. She didn't tell me all of this right there, but she had told me that she had walked in on it happening and um, she closed the door and left. And my dad had told her that if she was going to turn him in, then to let him know so that he could kill himself. Mm. And my, um, mom couldn't sleep with him in the same bed after that. And so he slept in the living room on an air mattress with a shotgun under the couch for months. My mom decided what to do. And us kids, like we were just oblivious. We were just we just thought he was sleeping out there because he snored really loud, which he did. So it was believable. Um, but so my mom had this big burden of what to do, right? Like she, she struggled and wrestled with it for a long time. And ultimately she did the right thing. Um, and she turned, she reported him to the authorities. Um, he got arrested and he served a really long time in jail. He's out now, which is a whole nother story for a whole nother podcast, I think, but Um, and a few months after that happened, my mom sat me down and talked with me because my sister had come to my mom and talked about my grandpa abusing her. And my mom wanted to know if he had done the same to me. And so I told her that he had, and then he got arrested. Like I said, just a few months after, and he also served a very long time in prison, um, and is out now, which is a whole nother story for a whole nother podcast. So, um, so there's a lot of, of trauma and deep rooted issues there. But, um, after my dad got arrested, my mom was a single mom living 
you know, in a house that she couldn't pay for with three teenagers that she couldn't afford and dealing with her own trauma and stress and healing and everything like that too. And so the church just kind of, um, we just kind of, we just became inactive. We just didn't go because there's so much work and she had teenagers and, and everyone was rumpy and hard and it was difficult. And it was interesting because in a really small town, I don't know if you've ever lived in a small town, but anyone who's from a small town knows that world, word travels so fast, yeah. so fast. So the that day while I was at school, the day my dad got arrested, my English teacher, no, it was history teacher. She, um, her dad was a sheriff of the county, like one of the county sheriffs. And she came up to me before class, put her arm around me and asked if I was okay. And I was like, yeah, I'm totally fine. Like, I don't know what's going, like, why would I not be okay? Because she knew that my dad had got arrested before I found out, like during school. Mm -hmm. So it was a big thing in the whole, like, you know, there's like three little towns that went to my school and everybody's kind of talking about it. And, you know, as teenagers, like, you don't know how to deal with anything. And so And what was really interesting, though, is the moment where my family needed the most support. Um, Like our ward is very, very Mormon rich town or Latter-day Saint rich town. Most of the people were members and everyone in the ward kind of isolated us. Um, The Relief Society president told my mom that she couldn't believe she had the nerve to stay in town after what had happened. Yeah, I see her eyes. I'm like, yeah, that she said that. And um, the bishop that was there like couldn't even make eye contact with my mom. And there was, you know, my mom had visiting teacher that was really great, but the visiting teacher worked at the same prison that my dad got moved to. And so it was a conflict of interest. And so she couldn't be a visiting teacher anymore. And she's the only one that came to support us and help us during that time. And so, you know, I hear in a lot of people's stories when they leave the church that that so-and-so did this or the bishop did that or or the community or the people and I I totally get that the people totally isolated my family and I can kind of understand to a little degree because it's a small town not a lot happens right in the small town like somebody gets a speeding ticket and everybody knows with you know within an hour and so it's people probably don't know how to process that type of big thing when they're not really that used to it. But I also struggled with, my mom really needed help. She really needed help and nobody was there to help her. And so ever since then, and this was, let's see, however many years ago, 21 years ago. So what year does that make it? I don't even know what is this 2000 2001 um and it was really interesting though just kind of that big shift we went from like going to church every Sunday to like not going to church at all questioning everything and not having support right from our word family so a year after that just before my 18th birthday um I was a senior in high school and I remember planning on moving out to live with my boyfriend who lived in Phoenix. He was going to college in Phoenix. We met in this small town and um, things just weren't working out at home. Everybody was just dealing with baggage differently. And I just planning to move out. And so my mom, um, it was like the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep. And so I ran a bath to like kind of relax myself it was like two o'clock in the morning and my sister's room was right next to the bathroom and she came out of her room it woke her up the sh- the tub woke her up and she started yelling at me because I woke her up and I started yelling back because that's what teenage girls do they yell at each other and um my mom came downstairs and she told me she just screamed at me she's like I want you moved out of this house before I get back from work tomorrow and so I don't fault her for that because, you know, a lot of trauma response, a lot of, a lot of stuff to unpack there, but, yeah. um, and I was already planning on moving out, but, you know, I just going to finish up some classes first, but, um, I packed up my little car with a few of my possessions and I left that day in the middle of a snowstorm in January and, um, and I, I moved into Phoenix. I, I had an apartment. I lived in an apartment with four guys. 
I had, um, there's a, it's a two bedroom, one bathroom apartment. I lived in with two guys and my space was a little coat closet. Like I had a coat, like, you know, where you hang up your jackets in. It was just that like as wide as my shoulders, maybe a little wider and just about as deep. Right. And that was where I put like my little, a little chest of drawers, all my clothes, all my hygiene stuff. And, uh, that was my space for a year. And, um, it was, you know, I, I was officially gone from the church by then. And so I did all the things that you can do that, you know, you never do in the church. I was, I was drinking and, and spending time with, um, friends doing just all the things that you just don't do, you know, when you're, when you're a member and you're actively living the church standards. And so, um, it was really interesting because a year, about a year after that, me and my boyfriend, we had gotten engaged and then we broke up. And so I was living in Phoenix, Arizona. My mom told me I could not come back home because she didn't have any space for me. And so I was like homeless in Phoenix. Mm. Um, for like, I had like two days to move out. And so it was really funny because I think all along my journey back into the church, it's not happening yet, but there have been little snippets of things to kind of like, let me know that God still loves me, you know? And that's the thing that I really like about our gospel is that it doesn't require membership of the church to feel God's love for you. We can feel that love no matter where we are, no matter what we believe, no matter who we are, um, no matter if we have a house or not have a house or live in a closet, a coat closet, right? So I remember when I got kicked out or when I was homeless, I, I thought, what am I going to do? And I looked up the closest church building I could find. And I called the clerk's number. There was a clerk, like the ward clerk's number is like on the website. And I called them and it was a singles ward. And I just asked if there's anybody that was looking for a roommate by chance. <laughs> it was so, it's so funny, but it ended up that I, there was somebody, one person looking for a roommate. And so I moved in with a stranger um, working as the waitress at Denny's and I went to, I didn't really go to church, but I went to a couple of the activities and like the Bishop had me over for Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, and it was really nice. I didn't become active or, or even have any desire to do so, but it was nice that somebody was showing up for me. You know, it felt good that I was able to rely on that part of our church. Um, and when I hadn't been able to, my family hadn't been able to for such a long time. So um, after I was living in that apartment with a friend or a, I guess she became a friend. I don't know. It was really weird. It's kind of like strange relationship. Um, I had, again, I didn't have my own space. Like she had her second bedroom was like a guest bedroom and I had a dresser. So I had a dresser, but, and, it, and the shower is a roof over my head. So I, I can't complain too much, but, um, it served me well for what it was, but, um, I, again, I was working at Denny's and one of my friends that was working there had joined the army. And we used to go to the mall where the recruiting office was, and we would just um, sit and just shoot the breeze with her recruiter. And one day I was there and he would like buy us lunch because like the, as you know, the government would pay for lunches and stuff. And so one day we were there with talking with the recruiter and I was like, you know what, tell me more about this army crap. You know, like what is, what is up with this army crap? Like what's the deal with it? Because I was working at Denny's when I, I just you know, got unengaged a little few months before that. Um, I had a scholarship to go to a college down in Phoenix, which I had given up because when I was engaged, I was like, I don't even go to school. I'm just going to be a stay at home mom, you know? So I was like, had nothing going for me. So I was like, what, what's the work? Tell me more about this army stuff. And like the next week I took the ASVAB test and the week, the month after that, I was off to basic training. And <laughs> it's really interesting because um, again, in basic training, uh, every Sunday, I don't know if people know a lot about the military or basic training, probably not too much, but you do basic training things every day, but on Sunday is kind of a rest day, mostly a cleaning day. You just like clean the barracks and the other parts, you know, around the grounds. Um, but they had every single denomination of church for you to go to. And so there's like Buddhists and Catholic and, and Baptists and, um, 
seventh day adventist but those guys went on saturday so like the saturday got uh, those people had a special little exception which was kind of neat but anyways um i digress a little bit but there's like all the different religions and so you would everybody would load up in like one of the back, back of an army truck and you would go to whatever church service you wanted to go to um based on your religion and i would always get in the back of the truck to go to the lds church because that's what i knew right and so we'd go there and the lds church had a reputation for um like people's families would send would mail like treats and candy and stuff like that to the church and then during sacrament meeting the soldiers could get their packages and eat their sweets and stuff like that during sacrament meeting and so lots of people wanted to go to the lds church because that's the one where you could get all the good stuff because that you couldn't get shipped that stuff straight to your unit and so it was really fun to have that little thing but there's always just like three or four people in the back of the truck on Sundays to go to the LDS church and those people went their own little ways and then you come back and clean the barracks and stuff all day so it's kind of like a you wanted to go to church if you believed in God or not because then that was less time you had to spend cleaning so <laughs> um it's really interesting throughout my military service um at first I went to South Korea after basic training and when I was in South Korea I met a guy who played high school football with my uncles in Utah. And so it was really cool because he's from, you know, my mom's hometown. I'm like, hey, do you know these guys? And he's like, yeah, I do. And so it's kind of cool because he was an active member of the church still. And he went to a Korean branch off post. And oh, a couple of times I went, you know, with him and his family to the Korean branch off post. And I was just kind of interesting, definitely different than Utah because it's such a small congregation. There's a couple dozen people maybe there. And it's just like in a little upstairs loft from the main like church where the Korean members went. And um, it's just interesting because like, like I said, I only went a couple of times. And I only knew a handful of other LDS members when I was in whenever people found out like I was LDS, then I would kind of get made fun of a little bit, but I was also like, not really too interested in defending the religion either, because I, you know, I was drinking at one point I was smoking cigarettes and I just hanging out with, you know, doing all of the things. And so, I mean, there's a couple of times where I would like stand up when they got like the complete core doctrine completely wrong. Like I would correct them, but most of the time I was just hanging out and having fun with people. Um, there's a couple of times where I went to like, there was some Relief Society activity where we made like little seek and find like quilt things where you can like little baby quilts. And I went there one time and I mean, like it was nice because I had that contact that knew my, my mom and her brothers. And so it was really nice. And then we, um, and then I got married when I was in Korea to my first husband, I'm married to a, a better one now. <laughs> my first husband I met and we met there. He was in the military. We got married at the embassy in Seoul. And um then we got stationed in Hawaii. Our whole um battalion moved from Korea to Hawaii. And but in between that time he got deployed to Iraq. So he was deployed and the whole battalion moved from Korea to Hawaii. And so we were in Hawaii and I was living on on base in a house while my husband my first husband was deployed. And for in some weird way, like the missionaries found me, like they have this way of doing that with members, right? They just find you. And so one day the missionaries show up at my door and um, they showed up at my door and they couldn't come in because I was the only one there. And you have to have another male in the house, right? When the missionaries are there. And so I would just open the door and stand out on my lanai and talk to the missionaries for, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes. We'd just chat and I'd, you know, go back and I'd smoke cigarette and drink and keep living my, my life because I had lost the desire to have anything to do with the church. My big um, examples in the gospel were my, were my dad and the people like in my town that didn't show up for us. And there's just a lot of trauma associated there with that and so I just didn't have any interest I, I I knew God loved me I believed in God still it wasn't ever didn't ever get to the point where I lost my faith in God but I just didn't have that desire the pull to 
you know, back there. And so the missionaries would come and we'd talk. And it turns out right across the street from me in this really small army base in Hawaii, where the only other members on post, they live across the street from me. And so I got to know them and they had me over for dinner a couple of times, which is really nice. And then my husband came back from, um, from Iraq and the missionaries kept coming. We would just chat. They could come in now and we would just chat just about whatever. Was and with your husband, did he have any like ties to the church at all? And if not, what did he think about having the missionaries over? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I was just about to get there. He, his dad is a, um, a Baptist priest. Oh, I forget the title. I don't know if that's right or not, but he was some type of clergy, um, in the Baptist church. And so, um, it was really funny because he had a completely different upbringing than me, completely different, um, belief system. Like the fundamentals were kind of there, but like, um, you know, just lots of different beliefs. And so it was interesting because they'd come over and my husband would just ask them all the questions and joke and laugh and not really anything doctrinally. And then my um, husband told his dad that the Mormon missionaries were coming over and he got really mad at him. He like, what are you doing? Like he had kind of got a little stern on the phone with him because, um, but he knew I was Mormon too when we got married, but we just, neither of us were practicing, neither of us were big into our faiths. So, um, <clears throat> it was really interesting because eventually my husband started taking the discussions. They were still discussions then. I think maybe it was right about the time come follow me was getting started. So I can't remember his discussions or maybe the come follow me book, but one of those. And eventually, you know, um, I stopped drinking, um, on New Year's Eve. I had my last drink on New Year's Eve and, uh, you know, sobered up a few hours so I could drive us home a few after that. And then, wait, what um, year, like how long ago was this? Like, so this was, let's see, 2008. Okay. So it was New Year's Eve, 2007. New Year's Day was for January 1st, 2008. So, um, then a couple of days after my birthday in February, you know, the missionaries had challenged us both to stop smoking. And so we stopped smoking and I've been trying to quit for a little while and just never really had a good motivation. But then like what happened was my husband quit before me. And then the missionaries were like, Oh, he can quit, but you can't like, he, you know, like it made it like, he's better than you, but they didn't say that, but like, it was like a competition thing and I'm really competitive. So I said, Oh, I can totally quit smoking too. And they took my pack of cigarettes and they like ran it over with their cars, like really like dramatic. fun little <laughs> symbolic, dramatic thing. Yeah. yeah, totally. And eventually they invited my husband at the time um, to get baptized. And he said, yes. And it was really amazing because I was starting to gain my faith back. We were going to church. Um, in a little town called Wahiwa on Oahu. And um, I love like Hawaii church is so amazing. <laughs> so, so amazing. And um, so we kind of had that little bit of, I was just like, okay, yeah, I can kind of like have that shift, right? Like, yeah, I think I'm heading back. I think I'm believing. I think like I can start to feel these things. And so he got baptized on the beach in front of the Laie temple. Oh my gosh, so like, that is yeah. incredible. It was beautiful. It was beautiful right there. Yeah. And so the only time the missionaries could go in the water when they're stationed in Hawaii is that they baptize someone in the ocean. So they always want to baptize people in the ocean. And so, I mean, it was perfect. It was beautiful. Um, and I remember a couple weeks after he got baptized, he was a military police officer. Um, and so he had to work sometimes on Sundays. And so there was a Sunday where I just didn't want to go to church, like without him. I don't go alone. It was like, oh, it's been a long week. You know, this was, I was out of the army by this time. I got now in May and this was sometime in the summer and I ended up going and just, I don't know why. I don't know why, because I just felt a little bit of a pull, like nothing super conscious or whatever, but I just went. And then I was in there and there was a couple members that like had become my friend's kind of my friends by then, you know, friendly. And I was sitting in church 
and they um it was about um messiah and king benjamin it was in the messiah it's in the messiah um book of the book of mormon and it was about king benjamin's sermon and i remember like the scriptures they were reading and um the spirit like touched me so hard like and i felt like so strongly that i was where i need to be and that heavenly father approved of this and that he loved me so much like i just could not stop praying through the whole lesson like everybody knew i was coming back to church everybody knew like that, you know, this is new and my husband was recently baptized and like, but I just seen there sobbing the whole time because I felt the spirit so strongly that verse in Messiah touched me like to my core. Um, and oh, I can bring it up and read it. Okay. So it's Messiah chapter two and it actually goes from verse 36 to verse 41, but I'm not going to read all of that. But, um, the part that like got to me that made me start really just like crying but also feel that spirit was um in chapter 236 and it said um and now i say unto you my brethren that after ye have known and been taught these things if ye should transgress and go contrary to that that which has been spoken that ye do withdraw yourselves from the spirit of the lord that it may have no place in you to guide you in wisdom's paths that ye may be blessed prospered and preserved I say unto you that the man that doeth this, the same cometh out in open rebellion against God. Therefore, he listeth to obey the evil spirit and becomes an enemy to all righteousness. Therefore, the Lord hath no place in him, for he dwelleth not in unholy temples. And like I have goosebumps right now, just reading it. But I that that verse, right? I had done that. I had left the church. I had denied those things I had been taught. The spirit was not with me. Um, and, and, and then how he so, I love King Benjamin because he's so direct. He just doesn't beat around the bush. And he says, you know, you're, an, you become an enemy to all righteousness and the Lord hath no place in you. I felt all the weight of all my decisions and everything that had happened over the last however many years just on me but at the same time like I felt this seriousness I felt that impression um that the things and the choices I were doing were not great <laughs> um but at the same time I also felt that peace and comfort that the choices I was making now were good and then it goes on um the last verse in Mosiah chapter 2 is um verse 41 and I absolutely love this verse. Um, and it says, um, again, this is verse 41 in Mosiah chapter two. It says, and moreover, I would desire that ye should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven, that thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember that these things are true for the Lord God has spoken it. Wow. That is so. And I know goosebumps, right? So I'm like, there's like two very polarizing verses, like this misery and an enemy to God and, um, all these things. But then it goes on to say, if you remain faithful, look at all of these things that are going to be given to you. Like, it felt like, so there's so many big feelings, so many big feelings. And, and, um, the remember to remember, um, words in there, or oh, remember, remember that these things are true for the Lord. God has spoken it. I, that's going to be a little important, maybe a little bit later on in the story, but it was just that day that I knew, right. That I was not on the right path mm -hmm. and that the, but the path I was starting on was the right one. Right. And so mm -hmm. it wasn't very long after that, maybe just a couple months that I found out that my husband hadn't actually really quit smoking or drinking. Um, right. And that he had a girlfriend on a different military base and that he didn't want to be married anymore. It's kind of like the big summary of all of it. And he, yeah. So, so we ended up getting divorced. He, he, I caught him, I caught him in these conversations and he had had issues with pornography and stuff in the past. But my thing is like, 
with marriage, even though we weren't still in the temple, right? Like we made a contract and a promise. And as long as you're willing to work on it, I'm willing to work on it. And we're both working on it together. Then it's going to work. We're good. You know, we're going to fight as if we're both fighting for it to work, then we have a really good chance. But as soon as he gave up and told me he didn't want to be married anymore, I was like, all right, I'm out. Like, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be in a marriage when half of it doesn't want to work. Yeah. So it was really simple divorce. We had no kids, you know, he was in the military. I had just gotten out. Um, it was pretty clean cut, you know, lots of, you know, dividing. He showed up to like go through all of our stuff together, completely wasted drunk. So I just got to decide what to do with everything, which was nice, but I also didn't like take advantage. It was pretty, like I said, pretty clean cut, straightforward. Um, and so I got, and my biggest part, I think the hardest part for me by that point, and I feel like the Lord had a big hand in my life, um, getting me to that point. Like I was ready to leave, but still had enough faith growing that I could like sustain myself because my family, they are still inactive. They're still inactive. Nobody in my family, um, is active members of the church. And so like nobody was going to help me come back. And so I left Hawaii and I moved back to Utah in the end of September and it was too cold for comfort. And my mom finally, my mom had space in her home for me this time. She had gone remarried, um, since, you know, in the years that had passed. And so I stayed with my mom in this, the same, uh, different small town, same area. Um, she had moved out, but moved to a different place. But, um, anyways, so I, I moved and I ended up getting a job in Provo. So I moved up to Provo in my own little, I had a one bedroom house all by myself um, in Provo. And then I hadn't gone to church since I left Hawaii because I was like, what do I do now? Like, I, I wasn't quite sure. I wasn't quite strong enough in my faith yet. I, I had no idea what I was doing. My mom wasn't active, right? So there's like nobody to go to church with when I lived down there for a few weeks. And then in Provo, I wasn't really excited to be the recently divorced single yeah. mm -hmm. person. You know how Provo yeah. is. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's really, um, really, uh, oh man. There's just lots of inexperienced yeah. young Mormons there mm -hmm. in yeah. the church. And I was very experienced by this time. Like I had a lot of life experience, right? And I just gotten out of a marriage and um, I was still unstable in my faith. And so I didn't go to church for several months. But then I remember one day um, I had a cousin of mine, kind of like a second cousin twice removed. And we're weird like that because we are Mormon. So we know our genealogy, right? So we know our relationships, but um, she kind of helped me a little bit um when I moved up to Utah County and then after a while like things just started to get weird with her and she um we got in an argument but she just stopped talking to me instead of wanting to resolve it and like I just want to talk it out like if we can talk it out let's talk it out and she chose to handle things differently than that and that's her way and I have my way not that either one is correct the correct way to do it but we kind of like lost touch and so here I am again in Provo alone, right? I have a little bit better space this time and a solid job, but I was kind of lost. So I looked up what church I was in. I was in a student ward and <laughs> it was actually in Orem, um, but it was a student ward. And so I just went to church. And by this time, um, I guess maybe I forgot to say this but after my husband got baptized um before we got divorced i had some repenting to do some like formal repenting to do and so i went to the bishop there in hawaii and we started my repentance process and i was actually on formal probation for a little while so i couldn't take the sacrament i couldn't have a calling i couldn't pray in church um things like that and when i left hawaii i was still on formal probation so i was like here i am like <laughs> still in formal probation, right? I had, I kind of didn't know what I was doing in my 
on my journey, I lost and alone, right? And so I went back to church and then I scheduled a meeting with the bishop that day that I went and we um, started, you know, kind of picked up and my new bishop called my old bishop and got all the things situated that I need to get situated. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but I do know that they talked and kind of got back on the way, but the first, no, the first, no, a couple, couple months, maybe. Yeah, this was December. So um, in December, I remember there was a fast and testimony meeting and there was a girl that got up to her testimony and she shared that her brother had committed suicide that summer. And um, she shared a lot of her journey and her um, process surrounding that. And while she was talking, I was like, wow, I just really love this girl. Like I, I feel this love for her, right? She had a really rough summer. I had a really rough summer. I've been through lots of trauma in my past too. And I was like, I want to know this person. And so that night, the Relief Society president in our singles ward had some people over for dinner. And she was one of the ones that she, that was there for dinner. And I was one of the ones and we met and we connected and we just became best friends. And she's still one of my best friends today, but her and a couple other people people that I had met in that singles ward and through those connections kind of became my family and they were there for me to like carry me through um one of the guys that we met like at ward prayer one of those nights um had served his mission in South Korea and I was like boom we have this connection so me and her and him became this close group and then one of his friends we just kind of became this like band of people and um they strengthened me so much. And I relied on them so much because I had, I didn't have people like that, that I could look up to. And so it was very helpful for me and very strengthening for me. I feel like God placed those people into my life. I know that I went back to church exactly when I needed to. I know that I met these people. I know that I overheard the conversation about South Korea, a word prayer at the right time. Like these people came into my life to bring me back and help carry me the rest of the way in. And um, they were, uh, shortly after, you know, I, I got taken off a of form of probation and I got my patriarchal blessing and it was a very beautiful blessing. And one of the things that they talked about, like in that scripture, how it says, oh, remember, remember these things. Um, ever since then, I was just like, every time I would see something in the scripture where it says, remember, remember, I'm like, oh, underline it because it's very important, right? You say, remember two times, right? So you got to remember, remember, not just from regular, remember two times, remember. And so in my patriarchal blessing, the words, remember, remember, show up multiple times wow. um, throughout my blessing. I know I got chills. I was listening. I was reread through it. And it's so important to me because I feel like the Lord speaks to us in ways that we can understand that. Mm -hmm. And, and at that time I was hyper-focused on the remember, remember things in the scriptures. And I still do that to the day. Remember, remember, because it's really significant things. And so kind of a, to wrap it up a little bit, I guess, um, not too long after that, I got endowed in the temple. I was, oh my gosh, 25 and, um, you know, no relationship in sight, no future husband in sight. And I was at the age where I felt like I wanted to progress more spiritually. So I got endowed and my, um, friends were all there with me in the, in my endowment room. My mom, um, was there waiting outside when I got out of the temple. Cause she, um, was able to go in and along with my siblings. Right. But, um, but it was nice to have kind of that family with me. And so then just a few years later, I moved up actually not even a few years is maybe a year later. I um, I moved from Provo to a place near Salt Lake city and I moved into a singles ward there. And that's where I met my current husband, the forever one. <laughs> and um, it's been nice because his family is really great. They're really strong in the gospel and, uh, it's been nice to have that to rely on as well. And, um, it's just interesting how throughout my journey, like I can look back and see that the Lord put me in certain places and certain situations where I would be, where I would have information and revelation presented to me so that 
I could receive it. Like, obviously agency is my choice. I could choose to receive it or not receive it, but I have been in those positions and in contact with those people and in those, you know, learning those certain things at those certain times to where I could at the right times to where mm -hmm. I could receive it and come back and, and the heavenly father just meets our needs in the most beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. There's been really cool things like along my journey, lots of cool little um, spiritual revelations that, you know, um, are so many that I couldn't even share them if I wanted to, but there's one that I do know that I will share is, um, I was driving home one day after a long day of work and really long drive. And I felt the very distinct impression that the reason why I got married the first time was so that I could be in Hawaii for the missionaries to find me so that I could start my journey back. And wow. so, cause I was, yeah, I thought that there's a very strong impression. Like I hold on to that and like really tightly because if I wouldn't, if I wouldn't have gotten married, I had a choice where I could stay in the military or leave. I would have stayed in and I, and I would have been in Iraq with my unit at the same time, the missionary started knocking on my door and not to say that I wouldn't have come back later on or any other time. Um, but that time was right for me mm -hmm. and heavenly father is very, very wise. And he knows when we're ready and open to receiving certain things. And he will give us that information when we're ready for it at the right time. And I, I, I don't necessarily think that all the circumstances that left to me leaving the church were my fault. There's a lot of influence. And as a teenager, you know, there's so many things going on in your mind and spiritually as well that um, I don't think anybody would have expected me to be the only one in my family to stay strong in the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, after our lives fell apart, I don't think anybody would fault me for that. I don't think anybody should fault anyone for leaving. First of all, I mean, we all have our own paths, mm -hmm. but I look back and um, there's just definitely some really cool things that have happened along the way. And like I said, like when I, while I was in and in the service before I even the missionaries even found me again, there's been lots of little moments where I just looking back, it wasn't obvious at the time, but looking back, you can see that heavenly father is very mindful of you and knows, and he's just waiting. He's just waiting yeah. for us to mm -hmm. come back. Um, I heard a devotional one time and I can't remember the speaker, I can't remember his name, but I see his face clear as day. Mm -hmm. And he said something to the effect of you can venture off the path as far, you can go off as far and deep into the woods and off into the distance, far as you want to, far as you can possibly imagine going. But the second you turn around, Christ is there to receive you, no mm -hmm. matter how far you've gone off. It's and, so true. That is so true. I love that. Yeah. And I love, yeah, I love that so much because like nobody's ever too far gone. You are <laughs> never too far gone from the Lord's love and from Heavenly Father's love. The second you turn around and look for it, it's right there for you. The second you turn around. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that so much. And so, um, here I am. I just, you know, there's just like everybody else's testimony. It kind of goes through moments where it's super strong and, and not, and other times where it's not as strong, but going upwards in that upwards trajectory. And, um, it hasn't been easy. There've been lots of really hard times, especially, um, especially with my family, not being in the church, uh, getting married was one of them. This was, I love the recent changes that they made where you can have a civil ceremony and then get sealed right afterwards, because when I got married, if you did that, you'd have to wait a year mm -hmm. um, to get sealed in the temple. And so we chose to get sealed in the temple. And so my mom wasn't there because I, I told my mom, I'm like, mom, I will wait for you. Like, I will wait. If you tell me like, you want to be there, I will wait for you to be temple worthy. And, and she wasn't even doing it. She didn't even do anything massive. I mean, she doesn't even drink coffee or anything, mm -hmm. right? Like she had, I, I, but I told her and she, she said, no, and that's okay because that's her journey, but it still hurt a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. um, to make that, to have to make those harder decisions. It was really interesting because 
my husband's family is very big and they took up a lot of the ceiling room, but I had my friends, right? My friends, the oh. three of those guys that were there, that were my family. And, you know, my grandpa was there because my grandpa's still in the church and his, um, and his wife who his first wife passed away, but his second wife, um, who was really, really amazing. Um, just like grandma to me. And, um, I had a couple of my aunts and uncles in there, but, um, but I missed my mom. And that was, that was a hard one, but one day, one day, maybe she'll come back and, um, it's yeah, just on my podcast. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe one day, maybe I just keep waiting for maybe the right things to say or the right time to maybe bear witness or bear testimony. But I've never felt like there's been actually a couple of times that I have, um, the Payson temple was built and she was born in Payson. And, and I was like, mom, so you're going to go to the Payson temple when it's complete. And she's like, whenever I come back to the church, the Payson temple will be the first one I go to. And I was like, well, we're like we'll, we'll take it no pressure I'll take a I'll take a win I'll take a win yeah. you know and um yeah I guess that's kind of my journey yeah I guess awesome. I've been talking for a while <laughs> yeah. um we have just a couple more minutes left but I I just I love what you said about you know the second that you turn around the savior is waiting to to embrace you and it's so true I think that you know, in my own personal journey, I, um, you know, was on drugs and all that. And, um, I just was like, you know what, maybe I can just see if like the church will, you know, help me and so, like, give me some sort of fulfillment or, you know, cause I had tried everything else to try and get my life back together. And it was like, when I made that decision that I was just going to like experiment as Alma says, I was going to experiment and see what happened. And, you know, and it truly did like my, I, had all of these little things. And this is a common theme that I see in people that come back is they see all of these little things, like, you know, just all the things that you mentioned in your story with, you know, the missionaries and like your friends and, um, the South Korea, the, your friend that served in South Korea. And it's like all of those little miracles, they may seem like, you know, not that big of a deal to somebody that's an outsider, but when you're in that position and you see these miracles happening, it's so, incredible. Like, for example, when I first was, you know, starting to get clean, I was only like two weeks sober and I was in rehab and I found this book of Mormon bookmark in this Bible at the Salvation Army in the middle of Fresno. And I was the only person that had like church roots and it was just totally random and crazy. And I, I found that common theme and people, since I've been doing this is hearing them come back and they have these, these little miracles that they see in their story. And so it's just so incredible. And, um, you have an amazing story. You've been through a lot and it's, it's really cool to see how you've come back and, you know, where your life is today and, you know, how you can make it through traumatic events and you can make it through hard things. And, um, and your life is amazing today. And I loved in that scripture, how you said, um, well in Mosiah, how it says that if you, uh, keep the commandments, there's a blessed and happy state. And yes. it's so true. It's, it's so true. And, um, you know, just in my own life and just what you described, it's like the, the fruit of the fruits of how you were living your life before coming back. And then the fruits of how you're living your life today, it's like, you, they're very obvious. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I love that. That's kind of what that scripture reminded me of, but, um, yeah. Any last thoughts, any thoughts or advice you might give to somebody that's thinking about coming back or struggling or any thoughts that you have? Oh man. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, you don't have to be perfect at it. You don't like, mm -hmm. you can't, it, it, nobody expects you to it'd be unreasonable to expect anybody to do all the things right. The second you decide, yeah, maybe I want to come back. Like I had to pick, I had to just pick one thing at a time, work on one thing at a time. When I, when I was coming back on my journey, work, work on tithing. I got tithing down solid, feel comfortable with that. Okay. Next, like work on my sailor mouth. So I had a mouth of a sailor. I need to stop saying the F bomb, like in two times a sentence. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I just like, okay, I'm just going to stop saying it. I still think I'm just going to stop saying it. So I stopped saying it. And then I stopped thinking it. And that took a couple months. And then I got that down. It was second nature to me. So then I moved on to something else. Right. And, you know, and 
it's, you're not going to be perfect at everything all the time. Even, you know, right now I'm not perfect at everything all the time, but it can feel overwhelming to have to do all the things and all the, make all the adjustments right Mm -hmm. at the same time. And you don't have to, you don't have to do that. Pick one thing, do one thing and do one thing until you're really good at it. And then find something else to add in. I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You're amazing. And I am Thanks. just so excited to have you. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. It's so great to chat. Thanks. Yes. Okay. All right.